Uh, <clears throat> there's just one thing I'd like to uh, tell uh, the host that uh, there are some videos of patients and I have not taken consent for showing them uh, except for teaching purpose. So recording of those videos is not allowed. If somebody records and then, you know, uh, puts them on the net and all that will not, uh, it might uh, be objected by from the patient Uh, good evening. I hope you can all hear me. You know, these are the difficult times due to the COVID pandemic that we are all dealing with. You and I, each of us is doing our best to overcome this pandemic. When you do step out of your house, only if it is necessary, wearing the right mask, making sure you keep the safe distance. And of course, when you are sure about your hand sanitization, you're not only protecting yourself, but you're protecting everyone else around you, your family, your friends, your community. That is the only real way that you and I are going to overcome this pandemic. But while we are doing that, Life doesn't stop. Life goes on and several newer methodology of doing things comes through. So today, you and I will look at how do we learn, how do we manage several groups of conditions. On behalf of the NeuroAid and the Research Foundation, let me welcome each one of you to this wonderful evening. The NeuroAid and Research Foundation is a not-for-profit organization which was founded a few years ago primarily to support and promote high-quality neuro-rehabilitation. Most of us are aware that neurological disease and neurological disabilities often require long-term, prolonged, and often complex kind of rehabilitation, which needs to be continued. And many of the poorer people may not have the wherewithals to have the access, nor be able to afford that kind of therapy, which is paramount in the recovery. And that was the basis on which the NeuroAid and Research Foundation was formed by a few colleagues 
and sustained very strongly by the passion of Mrs. Raji Chandru. And our aim is to make sure that the lack of rehabilitation should not be hindering the recovery of somebody. This evening, we'll be talking about Parkinsonism, called Parkinson disease, called the shaking palsy, among several other names. You and I know that at least one or more friends or family have suffered from this chronic and quite often debilitating condition. Several million in the world suffer from this condition. In India, the conservative estimates peg the figure at over a million people who suffer from this condition. What happens in Parkinson's disease? We all know that it's a condition which affects the central nervous system. It affects the movement of the individual. It can cause a lot of shaking or tremors, as we call it. It causes a lot of stiffness or rigidity, as we know it. It slows down the movement of the individual. It makes walking very difficult. As the disease progresses, people might develop depression, anxiety, dementia, emotional and sleep disorders. To discuss this condition, neurologically, what it is and what can be done, and to see how valuable good quality rehabilitation is, we have two experts with us today who will speak to us and then address a lot of our questions. I would request each one of you to make sure that you remain muted during the conversation. Send your questions on the chat box so that others who are listening will also benefit from your questions and this will avoid a lot of repetitive questions. So let me begin by introducing Dr. Mukul Varma, a senior consultant neurologist at the Indraprastha Apollo Hospital. Since 1996, he obtained his DM in neurology from the prestigious King George's Medical College in Lucknow. He has a special interest in movement disorders and has been interest, initiated in the Deep Brain Stimulation Program for Advanced Parkinson Disease at the Indraprastha Hospital. He has been a participant and has been a principal investigator in several clinical trials associated with Parkinson's disease and has quite a few publications in those areas. He is a member of several international neurological societies. In addition to these professional qualifications, this man is an interesting parallel life, which includes, he is an excellent bird photographer. The proper birds I'm talking about. He is interested in trekking and rafting in the Himalayas. He is a qualified scuba driver. Did you hear me say driver? I meant diver. <laughs> so just a stick of the slug. <laughs> so I think before I bring him on, the greatest quality for Mukul Varma, let me tell you, he's an amazing, the committed doctor, very passionate, very caring for his patient, and a great friend. So can I introduce Mukul? Mukul, would you like to take over? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Subra, so for those kind words. So um, I am uh, just going to speak for about 15 minutes about some signs and symptoms and certain basic things about Parkinsonism and Parkinson's disease. And then I'll, uh, 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 I'll hand over to Dr. Prabhat Ranjan, who is going to talk uh, who's, uh, his, his main talk today. And so I'll be kind of an introductory thing for just uh, telling you some of the uh, signs and symptoms. If I just... Sorry, Mukul, can I uh, be rude for a moment and interrupt you? Just to remind all our participants what Dr. Mukul Varma mentioned earlier, in the interest of the patient confidentiality, please do not record any of the videos that he will be showing because this is very, very important. 
we as treating doctors respect patient confidentiality immensely. Thank you. Thank you. That, that was uh, the right thing because we don't want any uh, people coming back to us and saying that. So I'm just going to share my screen now and I'm going to start my presentation. Is my screen being shared? Yes. Right. So uh, I'm going to talk about Parkinson's disease, some basics. There's not enough time to cover too much, but we'll, I'll try to kind of keep it uh, as simple and as uh, sweet as possible. Uh, so you know that Parkinson's disease is a dysfunction of the basal ganglia, which are basically the striatum the pallidum and the subthalamic nucleus and the substantia nigra. And that is called nigra because of its dark coloration, which you can see here. And this is the place where the dopamine producing neurons are, uh, are in the brain. The function of the basal ganglia is to receive information from the cortex, process it and send it back to the cortex and for things to be done. Now, uh, this is done through several corticostriatothalamocortical loops and uh, the premotor loop is concerned with mainly the spontaneous movements, the initiation of spontaneous non-stimuli movements, automatic movements. For example, if you have once learned how to drive a car, then you don't uh, need to think about how you're driving. You can be talking on the uh, on a phone, you could be talking to somebody else and still you're driving. So these are automatic movements and these are being covered by the basal ganglia and postural reflexes. But movements are not the only thing. They also, through the orbitofrontal loop, they regulate social behavior, your state of inhibition, your state of disinhibition. And through the lateral prefrontal loop, they control executive function, planning and working memory. Uh, Parkinsonism is a syndrome in which you have four uh, features mainly. The, mo the fundamental feature is akinesia, which basically means a paucity of movement. And this could be hypokinesia, which means uh, less movement. It could be uh, bradykinesia, which means slowing of movement. And this is a fundamental feature. And if somebody has tremor, but does not have akinesia, then he is not a patient of Parkinsonism. Uh, the next is rigidity, and this is a lead pipe kind of rigidity. And sometimes when it is superimposed with tremor, we call it a cogwheeling rigidity. Then you have postural and gait disturbances, which I will discuss uh, in the next few slides. The cause of Parkinsonism, as the commonest are the degenerative causes, amongst which Parkinson's disease is the commonest and this forms about 30% more, uh, more than 30% of all the patients visiting a movement disorder clinic. Then, uh, and this is called Parkinson's disease. So it, Parkinson's disease is actually a form of Parkinsonism and the two are not the same. So Parkinson's disease is the commonest. This is a degenerative condition. Then you have other degenerative condition, conditions with, which are called atypical Parkinsonism. And they are listed here, PSP, uh, corticobasal degeneration, MSA, Lewy body dementia. And then Parkinsonism can be drug induced, which is commonly seen with antipsychotics and certain antiemetics. And nowadays levosulpiride is also commonly seen to cause Parkinsonism in elderly people. And any disease which cause damage to the basal ganglia can result in Parkinsonism. So in Parkinson's disease, which is the degenerative variety, which is a slowly progressive incurable illness, the theory behind the etiology is that some environmental toxin or some genetic factors, they cause an alteration of an intracellular protein called alpha-synuclein protein. And this altered protein becomes toxic to the cells and then starts to destroy the neurons. So this is stored in form of Lewy bodies within the neurons. Uh, but after some time, this uh, aggregation of the Lewy bodies 
uh, is overwhelmed and the toxicity of the protein destroys the cell causing a neuronal death and this kind of thing is seen in the olfactory bulbs so loss of smell is a very early feature of parkinson's disease it is seen in the brain stem and then from there it ascends upwards into the substantia nigra and into the cortex and this is the uh, cross section of a patient of parkinson's where you can see that the substantia nigra is much less uh, uh, pigmented the epidemiology it affects mainly elderly people and the mean age of onset is 60 and one in 200 individuals above the age of 80 will get Parkinson's disease. And rarely 5% of cases have a young onset. There is a negative association with coffee drinking and smoking. And if somebody in a first degree relative has Parkinson's, then you have a 2.5 times the risk of developing it. And there is a weak association found with pesticide exposure. So the symptoms and the signs are elicited by a few weeks videos which I'll show. This is a patient, you can see the masking of his facial expression. This is called hypomemia. And you can see that his rapid alternating movements are very erratic and slow. He's unable to get up from the stool and needs assistance to do that. So there is a severe bradykinesia in this patient. There is not too much tremor. And uh, there are certain varieties of Parkinsonism which have more tremor and certain varieties which have more posture and gait instability. So this is the posture and gait instability variety. You can see that he has a shuffling gait. He has a stoop posture. And when this gets uh, more advanced, then the stooping is more. You can see this is a tremor. And he's demonstrating something called propulsion, where they start going very fast and can fall. Now, the cardinal symptom, which I already told you, is bradykinesia and not tremor. In this patient, you can see there is an asymmetry of tremor, uh, of uh, bradykinesia. It's on the right side. You can see that. And asymmetry is a feature of the typical variety of Parkinson's disease. And why I wanted to show is that in this other patient, there is no uh, bradykinesia. He has tremor, but his tremor is a cerebellar tremor and it's, it doesn't have any bradykinesia. You can see he's able to move with speed. Only thing is that he has loss of uh, control over his movement. So he's not a patient of Parkinson's disease. He's a patient of spinocerebellar ataxia. Another patient showing the tremor, which is typically a rest tremor, which you, dis which you can elicit by distracting the patient. And you can see that this is more on the right side. The moment the patient starts to use his hand, the tremor will stop. You see now it stops and then it re-emerges and that's called an emergent tremor. So Parkinsonian tremor is a rest tremor which stops on movement then re-emerges. And this is how you can differentiate it from different varieties of tremor which now here is a patient of action tremor the tremor comes when the patient is using his hand and whereas it was not there on rest and this is a patient of essential tremor so this patient is not a patient of parkinson's disease another thing which we see is called freezing where the patient gets up and the feet get frozen to the ground he is trying to walk but they are kind of like frozen it's also called magnetic gait and this is seen most when the gait is being initiated and when the patient turns, that's when it happens more. And uh, another thing that one can demonstrate is the pull test, which shows loss of postural uh, stability in the patient tends to fall when you pull a patient. Normally, a patient would uh, uh, regain his posture. In atypical Parkinsonism, the things are much more rapid. And there are certain signs which one can see. And in this patient, you are seeing a wide-eyed look and supranuclear gaze palsy. The patient is not able to look up and down when the patient is being instructed to do so. And you see a wide-eyed look. This is a patient of progressive supranuclear palsy. And the, in the other patient, you see 
So the speech is very fast and this is called tachyphemia and this is seen in a patient of PSP. All these features can appear in much later in Parkinson's disease also, but usually after 10 years or so. But in atypical Parkinson's, these features, they begin with these features. Uh, in, in Parkinson's disease, the MRI is usually normal, but in atypical, you can see different varieties of signs. This is known as a hot cross bun. You can see a hot cross bun here in the medulla, in MSA, in cerebellar atrophy, you can see in spinal cerebellar degeneration. And hummingbird sign, you see a beak-like hummingbird uh, in PSP. And loss of postural reflexes are even much more worse in patients of atypical uh, Parkinsonism, especially PSP patients. But Parkinsonism can be drug-induced also, and this is easy to treat. As you can see in this patient, she, had, she was taking antipsychotics, which caused uh, um, features of Parkinsonism. You can see the poor arm swing, the tremor, all of those things are there. And then after stopping those medications, the patient has improved. You can see she is much better. But apart from uh, motor symptoms, there are lots of non-motor uh, features in Parkinson's disease and they can be divided into four categories. The first is a neuropsychiatric dysfunction. About one third of patients will get depression, mood disorders, anxiety, cognitive dis dysfunction, dementia, they get psychosis and impulse control disorders and other compulsive behaviors. Many of them will get autonomic dysfunction like orthostatic hypotension, urinary dysfunction, sexual dysfunction, sweating, drooling of saliva. Then disorders of sleep and wakefulness are very common. There is a lot of sleep fragmentation and insomnia in these patients. They can get REM sleep behavior disorders in which they thrash around and uh, scream during sleeping. And they can also get daytime sleepiness and sudden onset of sleep in the day. And some patients will get sensory symptoms like pain, loss of smell, which I already spoken about. And one needs to see the whole picture in these patients because non-motor symptoms adversely affect the quality of life. They are frequently not declared by the patient and maybe even medication induced. So you may have to change the medication and they may even precede the motor symptoms even before the motor symptoms appear. So you have to have a look out for the non-motor symptoms. As you can see, this is a scarlet minivet and we can miss its spouse, which is always with this bird. Whenever you see a scarlet minivet, you see the spouse nearby. So you have to ask for these non-motor symptoms. Then you know that levodopa is one of the uh, mainstays of treatment, medical treatment of Parkinsonism. In Parkinson's disease, they develop something called the motor fluctuation stage, the on and off phenomena. And uh, so when the patient, the, the effect of the medicine wears off very quickly and they go back to hypokinesia, bradykinesia, and the moment you give medicine, then they start having dyskinesias. And as you can see in this patient, he has levodopa induced dyskinesias, which are foriform movements. And dyskinesias can be peak dose, they can be end of dose, and they can be biphasic. It's not, there's not enough time to go into that, but there are ways to manage all these things. What about neurosurgical treatment? As you know, that in Parkinson's disease, because of the dopamine being reduced in the central medulla spinal and central medulla, there is a hyperactivity of the nuclei in the subspinal fluid. And this has been shown in patients who are given medical reverse dopamine medication and they have dyskinesias due to the subspinal fluid movement and the very early onset. So, no, I've unmuted. Uh, Mukul, can I interrupt you, Mukul? We have lost your voice. Just type in the chat that we can't hear. Yeah. 
Sorry, we lost your voice, Mukul. Kindly check the attachment of your uh, headphone. Can you hear? Hi. That's better. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Sorry, I. No. So, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Okay. So, uh, in deep brain stimulation, we put an electrode in the subthalamic nucleus or the uh, GPI, and that uh, uh, a high frequency stimulation causes an inhibition of the target nucleus, and thereby uh, we uh, inhibit the overacting nucleus and uh, cause advantages. But uh, this is an advantage over lesioning the lesion, uh, the nucleus, because this can be undone, it can be adjusted and programmed, and programming is very important. It can be done on both the sides and leaves intact brain tissue for future modalities. So this is a patient of mine who we did deep brain stimulation very recently. My colleague, Dr. Sudhir Tyagi performed the operation and I did the programming. Uh, you can see he's a very advanced Parkinson's disease. He can barely walk. Sorry. And uh, he needs assistance to get up. He's got severe bradykinesia. And then after the deep brain stimulation, this is his son sent me his video. So he's done really well. And deep brain stimulation is a boon for many patients. Only thing is it's rather expensive, costs about 15 lakhs and not everybody can afford it. So in Parkinson's management, this is my last slide, a multidisciplinary treatment is needed and uh, you need a neurologist, psychiatrist, ger geriatrician, a urologist, you need counselors and a neurosurgeon. But most important, you need a physiotherapist and a neurophysiotherapist. So I won't come between you and Dr. Prabhat Ranjan, who is going to talk to you about recent advances in neurophysiotherapy for patients of Parkinson's disease. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Mukul Varma. I think that was a wonderful overview of what Parkinson's is about and very useful for many of us who probably would not have understood the deeper part of the neurology of it. And it was really very heartening and very fascinating to see the response to the deep brain stimulation on this particular gentleman. And I'm sure there'll be many, there'll be many who would benefit from this kind of treatment. While many of us are dying to ask you a lot of questions, I think we'll probably bring in um, Dr. Prabhat Ranjan at this point in time, as you've highlighted the value, the value of the physical therapy in restoring normalcy to these people. We are really very pleased to have with us Dr. Prabhat Ranjan, who's currently working as a senior physiotherapist in the Department of Neurology at the prestigious All India Institute of Medical Sciences for over the last two decades. He's a member of the Delhi Council for Physio and Occupational Therapy, an executive member of the National Indian Association of Physiotherapists. He has been a visiting faculty to several colleges for a long time, an examiner to several universities, has organized six international conferences on physical therapy at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. So I think you're all waiting to listen to the expertise of Dr. Prabhat Ranjan. Dr. Prabhat. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Mukul Verma. Uh, you had a very nice presentation. I think uh, we have covered that part of uh, the main uh, basic uh, pathology and etiology of the Parkinsonism. So I will be cut shorting that part and uh, uh, 
mostly i will be concentrating on the physiotherapy part and what are the stages and what are the uh, testing tools for the uh, functional outcome of the parkinsonism patient so i'll just Some technical problem is there. So now it's clear, sir. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So I will also talk about the artificial intelligence. Uh, all that how it uh, can impact the functional outcome of a Parkinsonism patient. So I will uh, skip these parts as uh, it has been discussed already by uh, Dr. Mukul Verma that what is Parkinson's disease as there is shaking, stiffness, difficulty in walking and uh, it is a disease of elderly. The cardinal signs, these has been discussed by him. So there are stages of the Parkinson and it has been divided into uh, five parts. Number one stage is that uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Mukul was showing the video of a, a patient having a resting tremor and then the functional tremor, in that if the person is able to perform the task very uh, smoothly, but there is some difficulty, but smoothly he can perform the task, then that patient can be considered in stage one. He can walk nicely. He can uh, have the facial expression. There may be little difficulty, but though also he will be able to perform the task that was uh, stage one in stage two he may need uh, some uh, that bradykinesia that slowness of movement increases the time which earlier he was taking the uh, to perform the task was around 10 to 15 seconds now he will take around 20 to 30 seconds so when the time increases the symptoms little bit get worsen up then we can say that the subject has achieved the stage two part. In stage three, he will have that uh, movement, but he will need some assistance. He will have this more apparent slowness. The slowness will be apparent. He will have a frequent fall and he can still live independently, but he will need some assistance uh, while doing some uh, activity, which is related to of uh, that smaller activity like dressing, like combing, like eating. He will need little bit of assistance in performing those activities. In stage four, a uh, patient needs a lot of assistance either for walking, either for performing any task, and he is not able to live independently where he doesn't need uh, to, uh, where he needs some assistance and he is not able to live the life independently, his quality of life is decreased, then we can say that this is stage four of the Parkinson's disease. And this is stage four. And then stage five uh, is a bit challenging for a physiotherapist also in order to get the functional outcome because uh, uh, that bradykinesia, slowness of movement, tremors, and all that are very evident. And in that condition, as uh, uh, Dr. Mukul Verma has shown about the DBS part, that DBS helps a lot. And when it is properly, uh, you can say that when proper doses and everything is set and with the help of the physiotherapy, we can achieve some of the functional outcome in those subjects. In stage five, mostly the patients are bedridden and he will require some type of nursing. He will always, for anything, he will require the help or the assistance and 
he will not be able to perform any of the activity independently that we can say that it is stage four non-motor functions has been described by uh, dr mukul so now i will come to the one of the uh, scale which is very much important in uh, uh, parkinson's disease in calculating the functional outcome of the subject and it is known as unified Parkinson's disease rating scale. This uh, scale is having a very a large amount of functional activity where from the mental level, cognitive level, from the ADL, everything has been planned out in a very systemic manner and the overall score is 199. And if one is able to achieve that uh, 199 99 then we can say that the subject is having good functional outcome but if it is decreasing and it is below 60 then we can say that the subject is having a poor quality of life and he will lead he will need some assistance in leading some good quality of life and there are four scores in that one score that one suppose we take the mental aspect we will ask him the uh, memory about memory and if he is able to answer that uh, memory very properly then you can say that the subject is having normal uh, UPDRS score in terms of mental and if he is having some difficulty in reminding that thing or there's some slowness then you can grade two if he takes much time if he needs some type of hint or tape to uh, memorize those things then you can grade that uh, a score as two in mental aspect and three even if you are giving some clues or anything and hesitation the awkward look is there there is staring is there is uh, uh, not uh, able to memorize the thing and then later on after an hour or you can say that he uh, initiates uh, uh, something the, that memory is initiated then you can grade three and when he is not able to recognize the things in a mental aspect then four, four can be graded such that this is for the functional outcome also so any task has to be performed and if the task is performed nicely then zero you can grade time is taken suppose the 10 second time is taken then one grade can be given more time is taken and some difficulty is there then grade two may be there other 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 another performance is be, being given to the subject from task is given he takes some assistance and slowly and gradually is able to do the function then grade three and where he cannot perform any task then grade four in terms of the task so uh, for gate also for uh, uh, everything uh, there is a uh, one uh, uh, activity daily living speech also salivation also depression also all this can be calculated through this unified parkinson disease rating scale so this uh, i will skip these things dbs part so for physiotherapy when it comes to the rehabilitation as uh, dr mukul was telling that it is one of the most important part in his last slide last slide that physiotherapy is most important to gain the functional outcome in the subject and physiotherapy helps in the mobility, flexibility, strength, gait speed, aerobic capacity, and above all, this helps in leading good quality of life because quality of life is decreased in this patient due to the slowness of movement, due to the rigidity, due to uh, stiffness in the joints. So we have to maintain this, this quality of life through these exercises. Mobility exercises can be given, flexibility exercises can be given, strength has to be increased, gait has to be properly addressed, and aerobic capacity for the, because what happens that the posture is tubed, uh, the muscles, the breathing muscles, diaphragmatic muscles, and the chest expansion is low, then what happens that uh, vital capacity also decreases in those subjects, and we have to maintain that vital capacity for that aerobic exercises and breathing exercises should be also be focused for the good quality of life so uh, nowadays uh, uh, i will show the video of the exercises uh, as i finish this talk then uh, i will show the videos uh, that how to gain the mobility the strength and the stretching then we can have the later on 
that we can have later on. Now I will talk about the artificial intelligence. What is artificial intelligence? Now the things are the coming up uh, uh, computer sciences. See earlier we used to have the classes on board classes, in board classes, but now today we are in this era of pandemic as uh, Dr. Subramaniam was also telling that uh, in this era of pandemic we are connecting virtually and then virtual uh, education is going on. So this is a this short of things are like artificial intelligence and this artificial intelligence in terms of treating the subject of uh, uh, Parkinsonism is will become significant in the coming days, especially in India. Now it's not there so much significant, but it may come in the coming days and abroad. It is being practiced now easily now in a wide spread manner but india it will take time and i think that we should be prepared for that that how it helps in maximizing the goal or optimizing the functional outcome of any subject because this artificial in intelligence through their senses and all that they interpret the data they help in learning and adapting the flexibility of the uh, function so that a specific goal or a specific task can be performed so for that, uh, uh, for how to test the efficacy, for the testing of the efficacy, there are some tests like we can uh, go through the UPDRS scale. First, we can pre-treatment, post-treatment. We can see the UPDRS scale, time up and go test, Berg balance test. These tests can be performed pre and post and we, thus we can say that how much artificial intelligence has impacted in getting the functional outcome of a Parkinson's patient. So what happens that when uh, this is a, a view, you can see that there are, uh, this is a chamber where harness is there and if the patient stability is not proper, initially the harness is applied and as per the harness, he goes to that virtual world where there is a, a uh, all sorts of uh, 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 that software is placed and he will have the odd and even surfaces where he feels that he will feel that he is walking on those surfaces and slowly and gradually he will gain that balance as uh, Dr. Mukul was also telling that if one is driving the car and, and later on he, he doesn't need to have the that type of practice he talks on he works on then that that principle works in this and he is working on that uh, the, the working is done on that and then the such, such type of a pathway is created that the uh, subject starts doing on his own and this helps in getting his better functional outcome we, this I will show you through a video here The video is visible. Williams is buckled up and ready for action. It looks and feels like she's part of a video game, but it's actually high tech rehab for her Parkinson's disease. We know the video is not visible. We have to challenge patients yes. for them to get better. And so this provides a very safe environment for that to occur. The vert so you are not able to see the video? Cannot. Okay. Is it visible now, sir? Sandy Williams is buckled up. And no, no, we can hear the sound, but we can't see the image at all. Actually, high tech rehab for her Parkinson's disease. Sandy Williams is buckled up and ready for action. It looks and now, feels sir? like she's part of a video game. Okay. Uh, it's still not visible. For her Parkinson's disease. We now in neurorehabilitation. Yeah, no, that's what you need to do. Yeah, I think he's probably kicking at a different area earlier. Based on Sandy Williams is buckled up and ready for action. It looks and feels like she's part of a video game, but it's actually high tech for her Parkinson's disease. Visible, sir. Sorry, Dr. Ranjan. Yeah. I think it's still not uh, visible. And can I use this opportunity to remind everybody to remain on mute, please? 
Thank you. Sandy Williams is buckled up and ready for action. It looks and feels like she's part of a video game. Hey, Dr. Ranjan, again. Yes, sir. I'm not getting the video, sir. No, it's half the challenge patients for them to use. Would you like to put this on a PPT mode? On a play mode, it'll probably be okay. Yes, sir, we are checking it. Yeah. Yeah, just put it on a slideshow. I think it should be okay. Sandy Williams is buckled up and ready for action. It looks and feels like she's part of a video game, but it's actually high-tech rehab for her Parkinson's disease. We know in neurorehabilitation, you have to challenge patients for them to get better. And so this provides a very safe environment for that to occur. The video is not visible yet, sir? No, it's not, sir. It's not happening. Maybe you could just go back to your presentation yeah, yeah. And go back, go to the uh, slideshow. Sandy Williams is buckled up and ready for action. It looks and feels like she's part of a video game, but it's actually high-tech rehab for her Parkinson's disease. We know in neurorehabilitation, you have to challenge patients for them to get better. And so this provides a very safe environment for that to occur. The virtual reality treadmill has two belts, one for each foot, and a base that moves to mimic different surfaces. Yeah, I think continue with your presentation. Maybe we'll skip the video, not to worry about that. Uh, sir, this, uh, just I will explain what the video was about. This video was about the gait training, that uh, how the harness was done. And uh, uh, first, the simple task was being performed, and the subject was able to walk. And then we went to the dual task performance, because uh, dual task performance is a, a, a little bit uh, tough in uh, cases of uh, Parkinsonism. And with that, cognitive level also is sometimes impaired. So these tasks has been given to the subject and he was able to perform. And later on, uh, without harness, he was able to perform those tasks. So slowly and gradually, he developed the uh, skill and uh, he was uh, his functional outcome improved and he was working. Uh, Dr. Ranjan, could you speak a little louder, sir? Hello? Can you hear me, sir, now? I can hear you. I mean, there are some of them who can't hear you very well. Perhaps a little louder, please. So how it is happening, because as uh, uh, Dr. Mukul also said, that, that, that the brain, uh, brain is plastic and that neuroplasticity is also working in this uh, concept. And this neuroplasticity is helping in uh, subject in getting the proper functional outcome. So the uh, uh, other video was there that how these sensors work, that uh, um, magnetometer is there, accelerometer is there, and gyrometer is there. And these, how these works was the video that I'll see that it uh, plays or when it will play, then it will be good. The more I exercise, the better I feel. Like most Parkinson's disease patients, exercise eases Mary Spletter's tremors, halted gait. Sorry, Dr. Ranjan, can I interrupt? Yes, sir. Sure, sir. Yeah, I think the video is not playing. Maybe we could just move on so that, you know, we could take the questions and things. Yes. Let's skip the videos for the time being. It's not working. Yeah. Uh, sir, I have the video for my exercises also so that... Uh, uh, if uh, 
things work. That's right, you know, that's right. It's not happening, it's not happening. <clears throat> Anurag Srivastav says, uh, Dr. Ranjan, can you hear me? Yes, sir. The One of the options suggested is start your video uh. and then share the screen. Start my video and yeah, go off share screen. So Start that won't so that won't work. Sorry for the interruption. The video is not playing on PowerPoint. Yeah. Since oh. it's not playing on PowerPoint, it won't matter much. Okay. The only so option is like we did yesterday. We can play the video on the media player instead of PowerPoint. You can try and do that. Yeah. This is visible, sir. Hello, I am Prabhat Ranjan. And I'm a neurophysiotherapist. Yep. I am here to explain about some of the strengthening exercises for the Parkinson's patient. Uh, for, because it has been observed that uh, as the time goes or you grow, grow older, the muscle strength lowers down. And especially in the cases where there is some disease, then it has been observed that it is much weaker Hello, I am Prabhat Ren. So now it's fine, so you can let it play if... Video is playing, sir? Yes, sir. Now, now it was fine. Uh -huh. You can let it play. play. Yes. The first time you played it, it was uh, playing. Okay. The first time you played your... Uh... Uh, exercise uh, introduction uh -huh, uh -huh. video. Yeah, the starting was, was okay. Yeah. yeah. This is playing. stopped all of a sudden. Yeah. Hello, I am Prabhat Ranjan. No, and now it's not playing. Therapist, I am here to explain about some of the strengthening exercises for the Parkinson's patient. No, uh, it's not, uh, the video is not playing. That, uh, as the first, time. First time it was playing. Yeah. The first time you played it, it played, but yeah, then yeah. you stopped it and then you replayed it, then it wasn't. Again, sir, I will try it. Yes, now it's playing. Hello, I am Prabhat Ranjan and I'm a neurophysiotherapist. I am here to explain about some of the strengthening exercises for the Parkinson's patient. Uh, observe that uh, as the time goes or you grow older, the muscle strength lowers down. And especially in the cases where there is some disease, then it has been observed. It is fine. It is fine now. It is good. Weaker than the people of similar age with no any other neurological problem. In Parkinson's also, this happens, and uh, the subject who is suffering from Parkinson's are having a weaker uh, muscle in comparison to the other individual individual who are not having any neurological disorder. So uh, we can go for this training program. For that, some points has to be taken care. One is that there should be a suitable environment. For that, we have to make sure that uh, 
proper support is there so that one should not fall. The symptoms should be well within the control. Uh, suppose if he is, the subject is having on phase, then he will be able to do the exercises properly, but as soon as he goes into the off phase, then he will have some problem. The exercises should be done three times a week. Take a rest in between a day. One day you do the exercises, the other day you take a rest so that the muscle doesn't become so much of a key. Thing, one thing or more is important that the exercises should be done at any individual of Parkinson that the pace should not be much higher or much lower whatever pace he is having or he is generating himself at that pace only the exercises should be done so now i will demonstrate what are the simple exercises for the strengthening of the muscle i guess so take a chair the chair should be firm on the ground and make sure that it doesn't slips while getting up Initially, try to have the chair with the arm raised so that the subject who is uh, uh, suffering from Parkinson's can take the support of by lateral arm rest in order to get up. This exercise should be for, performed 10 times at a time and you can make a set of 10 repetitions. 10 set, then take a rest, then 10 set then take a rest and then cancel. So we can do it this way. Take the support of the armrest. With the support of the armrest, the subject will get up and then again he can flex his back and then sit down. Like this, he has to perform 10 repetitions and slowly and gradually as the time overcomes and he is feeling confident, the subject then he can stand up without the armrest, help of the armrest, and then sit without taking the help of the armrest. In this, we can adjust the height of the chair where we can start from the comfort level of the subject. If we have to make the height of the chair higher for his comfort level in order to perform the sit to stand exercise, then keep the level of the chair higher slowly and gradually we can lower the level of the chair in order to build the muscles of the lower leg this may help in developing the balance of the subject so for that take the support of the chair the chair should be firm on the ground it should not slip stand upright look in front take the support of the chair and then go on your heel and then slowly come down take do it for the 10 repetitions then down 10 repetitions then down then take a rest again 10 repetitions then take a rest then again 10 repetitions this will help in developing the muscle of the calf as well as also help in getting the balance movement while walking standing and that is lateral step up so keep one of your leg or the stepper and then with the help of your muscle power the body weight just get up hold and then come down then hold come down this also 10 repetitions wait for some time then 10 repetitions take rest and then if you are not able to do this exercise independently as there are some stages in the Parkinson stage 1, stage 2, stage 3 so stage 2 or 3 sometimes may need some support so keep a chair by your side or you can take the support of the wall stand against the wall laterally and then put the one leg on the stepper and then with the help of the support you can do this movement this will help in gaining the strength of your cordyceps muscle as well as your 
uh, calf muscles as well as your front, front foot muscles. So this will help you in gaining the balance also. Exercise is sliding down or you can say the half square. Take the support of the wall, put the leg a little bit front and then the uh, help of a body which is upright and is uh, touching the wall just slide down and it should be as such that it should not cross over your toe greater toe it should be near the toe or about at the parallel to the toe it should not be in front of the toe so get down then up if any problem in doing independently you can take support of the wall stand like this in the wall and then go up and then go down then go up then go down this also 10 repetitions take rest then 10 repetition take rest then 10 repetitions band the middle of the thera band doesn't get squeezed make sure that it is not squeezed and wrap in your hand put it in a such a fashion that attention is developed in between attention is developed so now i think that is the tension has been developed take the flutter part and then put it in the middle of your both leg both leg and the tension is developed so keep your arms straight sit upright and then flex your elbow in the meantime try to excuse your blades scapular blade and then open up the chest this time this we can do it 10 repetitions to strengthen the upper muscles like this from the back and the scapula will squeeze both the scapular blade will come together and the chest will open up we also done for the jump quality strengthening put the bathera band in the middle so that it should not slip put your hand straight slip and then slowly take a 90 degree straight and then down then other hand straight and then down then other head hand straight and down it should be done 10 repetitions but if you are any of the subject is not able to complete the repetition of the 10 then 5 5 sets also can be done then further we can proceed bilaterally also put the third band underneath your foot stable and then bilaterally we can proceed then we can also do it for the elbow tighten the third band and then the Flex your elbow, straighten up, flex your elbow, straighten up, flex your elbow, straighten up. Same this way, flex your elbow, straighten up, flex your elbow, straighten up. This can be done. 10 repetitions. If not able to perform, then make a set of 5-5 five five also. So that slowly and gradually the subject can progress for the 30 repetitions for 10 sets. So now for the strengthening of the lower limb, suppose you want to strengthen the muscles of the lower limb of the right side and how we can put the TheraBand, we should tie it over the leg which we want to strengthen in a such a manner that it should not slip. Then the other end should be at your other leg, put it in the middle in a such a way that attention is developed here. So put it here, 
you can I either you can hold with your hand or you can just put it underneath the chair hold it firmly with this leg and then lift up and down lift up and down lift up then down 10 repetitions this leg then the 10 repetitions after time the same manner with this leg and in that set you can do it for 30 repetitions in a set of 10 10. Then this exercise can be done in standing position also. We can uh, uh, take a hard chair so that we have to see that it should not slip. Otherwise on a bar, any bar is there. We can tie this, uh, just this is for the demonstration. I will show you that we can tie it underneath the chair. One end and the other end should be tied at the leg which we want to strengthen it in such a fashion that the tension is developed here and then we will tie it so just this way then out then we can do it in this manner also we can stand in front of the chair take it back front back hold it then front and we have to stand upright back then up. and back and up this can be done for both the legs one by one 10 repetitions take rest 10 repetitions take rest then 10 repetitions so when you go through the bands there are several types of band this is the moderate one uh, we can start with the low resistance band also the red one the red one is the low resistance and yellow one is one of the very low resistance this yellow one has having very low resistance then uh, heavy resistance is the blue and the black one black one i am not having but blue i am having the so blue and black one as per the requirement of the subject we can introduce the band therabands and this theraband exercise is very good in strengthening and especially in the subject who are in the stage two or stage three of the parkinson's disease there it can be helpful stage one it is very much helpful so we can try these theraband exercises also but please take care that this patient is stable the object which you which we are using is stable there is no chance of falling and environment should be very much cordial for the subject Apart from strengthening, we can go, go for stretching also. And stretching of the of trunk is very important because this becomes stiff and as this posture is stooped, then this uh, restricts the movement. So we can do the stretching, a very simple stretching exercise is there. We can take on, lie on the mat. We should lie on the mat. Flex both the knees. We have to flex both the knees. And when we are rotating the lower limb towards the left side, our neck should go towards the right side. Then again, if it is going to the right side, the neck should go to the left side. This way we can stretch. Other way, we can put the hand underneath the head Second step we can do that, this will stretch the pectorals as well and then we can stretch the lower limb, lower, lower limb and then we can take the head to the opposite side. If we are taking the limb to the right side then the head should go to the left side and we should make sure that our scapula as well as the elbow is not lifting up and it is stick to the ground as much as it is possible there are many other exercises these were the simple exercises which can be performed uh, with standing and the stretching then lot of exercises regarding to balance is there and for that specific those exercises we should consult our physiotherapist or the treating doctor so that he can refer to the proper neurophysiotherapist so neurophysiotherapists are much uh, more uh, oriented about these exercises and they will guide you well thank you thank you very much 
so uh, can i play the other video also if it is visible because last time it was not Uh, Dr. Ranjan, that was really that video came out very well. Uh, Sandy Williams is buckled up and ready for action. Sorry. It looks and feels yeah, like part of a video it's game, it's but it's actually high. Video is about the Sandy How Williams is buckled up and ready for action. Sorry. It looks and feels like she's part of a video game, but it's actually high tech rehab for her Parkinson's disease. We know in neuro rehabilitation, you have to challenge patients for them to get better. And so this provides a very safe environment for that to occur. The virtual reality treadmill has two belts, one for each foot, and a base that moves to mimic different surfaces. It can also react and adjust to a patient's movement, and a wraparound video screen completely immerses the patient into a real-life scenario. When I go over like a little hill, you feel it in the machine. Rather than just having the patient walk or an individual walk up and down uh, you know, a standard biomechanical track, now what we can do is we can change the uh, environment in a very dynamic fashion. Special programs are designed to work on specific skill sets while providing positive feedback. During weekly appointments at Cleveland Clinic, Sandy works with her therapist on gait and increasing stride length by touching her toe to a box. Other times, she's asked to target birds and butterflies while walking. This helps with balance and it satisfies that competitive spirit. I enjoy doing the birds and the butterflies and swatting them down and killing them. Uh, not that I enjoy the killing part, but I do enjoy the challenge of can I get them? I know once I slow down, it could come to the point where I couldn't move. So I'm willing to do whatever I can to keep myself going. At Cleveland Clinic, I'm Erica Foreman. So here we saw that how she became independent later on. Uh, first she was doing the single task, then hitting was there. That was the dual task also she was performing. So from simpler to uh, complex task, we can go for the subject and this complex task, if he's able, to, if he or she is able to perform, then he may have a good functional outcome. This video I am again showing. This is the uh, how the uh, virtual reality works. What are the, uh, the sensors which do help in getting the uh, accurate uh, uh, sense and, and uh, data collection in? Uh, The more I exercise, the better I feel. Like most Parkinson's disease patients, exercise eases Mary Spletter's tremors, halted gait, and lack of balance. She recently took part in a UCSF study to see if special video games could replace her regular exercises. The therapeutic games are the result of a marriage between game developers and scientific researchers. Well, UCSF had developed a series of exercise programs for patients with Parkinson's. And they asked us if we could actually make a video of it. And we said, you know, there's this new thing called the Wii. Why don't we make interactive games? UCSF researchers thought video games might be a welcome change of pace from physical therapy, which can be tedious. People very much like doing the games. They found them engaging, fun, and therapeutic. But developing games that would know if patients were using the right muscles in the right way was tricky. Health games need to detect a player's movements much more precisely than their consumer counterparts. So there's three different devices that you need to be able to sense where you are in a particular space. One is an accelerometer. Am I moving a particular direction? Another one is a gyroscope, which is which direction am I pointing? And then you th third, you need something like to say, okay, I need a rock solid north, and that's a magnetometer. These three technologies enable smart devices to do this. To make the technology more accurate, the developers created suits with nine built-in sensors. They were a, a big pain. The battery-operated suits were awkward and cumbersome, so the developers turned to camera technology. It's bathing you in infrared light and then taking that information and using some very clever software to say, ah, you just raised your hand. The camera technology does not need to be worn, but it's not as accurate as the sensors. Each one has their pluses and minuses, and we're looking at actually trying to perform a fusion between those two technologies. The UCSF study showed that despite their physical limitations, Parkinson's patients could successfully play the games at home. 
and they did them more often because they enjoyed them and they helped. Yeah. It was a fun way and an easy way to exercise right in my own front room at any time. I felt better. I felt more, more normal, more fluid, looser. In fact, the study found that after playing the games for 12 weeks, 65% of patients had longer strides, 55% had increased gait velocity, and 55% also reported improved balance. The hope is that if we can engage people in physical activity early in the disease course, that we might actually be able to delay progression. There. The therapeutic games could be available to the public as early as next fall. For Smart Planet, I'm Sumi Das. So here we saw that uh, how this uh, works uh, with the accelerometer, gyrometer, and manometer, and these sensor helps in getting the movement elicited, and then uh, uh, proper data can be collected and helps in getting the functional outcome. Also, as you saw that balance and all that, the rotation of the spine, uh, the trunk uh, was done through the uh, gaming process and uh, uh, it actually you can say that it was like a biofeedback system. So this is helping and I think uh, later on these type of technology will be uh, much more in uh, getting the uh, functional outcome in the Parkinson's patient. So uh, this was all about my presentation and uh, uh, nowadays uh, some uh, type of uh, other equipments are also there, uh, like uh, uh, we can have the, these equipments will help in uh, having the accurate data of the tremors uh, or the slowness of the movement. So these type of equipments are coming up. This will help us in uh, getting uh, uh, walking at set, uh, how much uh, cadence or the slow and movement or the time he took. Uh, this is for the hand tremor. This will count that uh, how much tremors he is having, uh, he or she is having in uh, one minute or two minutes. Then later on, pre exercises, post exercises, how much it reduced. So these type of things will help the, uh, us in getting more accurate research and more concise treatment to the subject who is suffering from the Parkinson's disease. Thank you. And in coming years, the advancement of technology, measuring of Parkinson's rehabilitation grows significantly for the better outcome and good quality of life. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Ranjan. I'm sure if this was a normal kind of a live meeting, most people would have stood up and given you a big round of applause. I think tremendous work, very well presented. Thank you, sir. I'm sure that, you know, following that very lucid presentation by Dr. Mukul Varma on the basic outlines on Parkinson's and its management, we've had a tremendous presentation on various dimensions of getting the best out of Parkinson's treatment. The role of the simple exercises was so beautifully displayed by Dr. Ranjit. The role of partnerships, the partnerships between the game developers and the researchers at the University of California. Playing games, you know, which you and I would have thought that people with physical disabilities may not be able to do. But you realize that the playing games was actually helping people develop yeah. excellent skills, improving their strides, developing the confidence, etc. He demonstrated the robotic walker to begin with. He spoke about the role of the wearables in reducing the tremors, measuring tremors, and measuring so many other parameters. So I think this has been a tremendous range of subject that we have covered on Parkinson's today. So maybe it's time for us to now go on to a few questions which have come our way. So can I just begin by addressing the first question to Dr. Mukul Varma? Mukul, would you tell us about how does one treat a patient with severe on and off phenomena in Parkinson's disease? Um, that's a very good question, Dr. Subra. Uh, as you know, in advanced Parkinson's, uh, there is uh, two phenomena which occur. One is that the medicine uh, liver dopa's uh, duration starts to wear off Increase very quickly. Volume, yeah. Can you hear? Yeah. Reduced it in between. Can you hear? I can hear, yeah. Okay. So, uh, 
there is a wearing off phenomena the medicines effect starts to wear off much earlier than what it used to in a, and slowly and steadily the duration of the treatment starts to go down the other thing that happens is that there the therapeutic window which means that the level of the drug within the blood if it is it crosses a certain threshold it starts to create unwanted side effects like dyskinesias which i showed you so you need to keep the the, the drug within that therapeutic window you don't want it to come lower than that level a concentration level in the blood and you don't want it to go above that a certain level and as time goes by this window becomes narrower and narrower so one of the things that need to be done is to start giving frequent medication and lower doses so that you don't have wide fluctuations in the blood levels you give frequent medication in lower doses so instead of giving one tablet thrice a day or one tablet four times a day you can give half a tablet six times a day and that tends to make the level more smooth and the on and off phenomena tends to get a little better that's one of the strategies there are many other strategies but uh, there is not enough time to uh, go into that so will you tell me uh, mukul what is the role is there a role of uh, botox in treating parkinsons not really botox is meant mainly for dystonia for parkinsons it doesn't have much role and uh, uh, maybe in some very uh, isolated case of a severe dystonic uh, uh, situation happening in a patient the early morning dystonia is known to occur this is known as the end of dose phenomena patients get up when the medicine effect has worn off and they get up with a painful dystonic uh, cramp or contracture happening in one of the feet so in that situation one can give botox in that to relieve that and uh, that will affect for about 4 months after that when one will have to repeat it but uh, def- usually changing in the dosing and using longer acting medication which you give in the night which tends to work till morning that works better than giving botox great now tell me i think you know when you look at uh, dbs you spoke about dbs and that is a very impressive change in the gentleman who had undergone the dbs now are there any specific criteria that you would apply while offering dbs to somebody yes uh, dbs basically does not work for atypical parkinsonism for msa psp uh, cortico basal ganglion degeneration those it doesn't work it's basically meant for parkinson's disease which is the typical variety and one of the criteria is that the patient should be responsive to levodopa if the patient responds to levodopa then probably he is going to respond to dbs as well and the patient should be in motor fluctuation stage where basically you want the current stimulation to have a constant effect and it's not a varying effect and therefore you can get a, you can stop that on and off and motor fluctuation by dbs so these patients respond better to dbs and of course if somebody has intolerable side effects to medication then he becomes a candidate for dbs great now we see many of these are elderly people who might be on medication for several other medical conditions now would you be able to name a few drugs which might either react with the anti parkinsons drugs either in terms of making them more potent or less potent yes uh, see uh, uh, one has to avoid taking dopamine blockers uh, so like metoclopramide perinom uh, and stemetil uh, even nowadays patients have a lot of constipation and for that they take a drug called levosulfiride and levosulfiride is known to uh, block the uh, dopamine uh, receptors and levosulfiride can cross the blood brain barrier so it can block the receptors in the brain as well so one has to avoid these kind of medications because they will definitely aggravate parkinsonism um uh, then uh, uh, many of these patients have psychosis and you have to avoid the typical antipsychotics cannot be given because they are also all dopamine blockers and they will worsen parkinsonism only a few a typical antipsychotics are uh, okay to give and out of them quetiapine 
and the other is uh, close up pin these are the two ones which can be used safely in these patients and we use them quite often great i think uh, you know mukul i think this has been tremendous i think the way you've responded mm -hmm. very very lucidly and very briefly to the questions i'll just move on to uh, professor ranjan you know i think uh, the way you showed us the way parabands are used to strengthen various muscle segments of the body and the importance of frequent exercises with the adequate gaps that you mentioned now will you tell us is there a particular category of patients a particular age group or a particular type of patients who need a particular set of exercises or is it that you would do an overall strengthening for all patients and not necessarily focus on a particular group of muscles dr ranjan so as you are talking about the specific group then uh, uh, it is depending upon the stages of the parkinson's disease and if the stage 1 is there then uh, we can delay the progression by the exercises and with the uh, help of the medicine and in that condition this type of strengthening exercises flexibility exercises and the musculoskeletal flexibility exercises these are very important that till stage 3 it works and in stage 4 and 5 the on and off phase is there it becomes more challenging at that time to treat this type of patient so as dr mukul was telling that when there is a effect of lower do liver dopa then uh, on phase is there and at that time we can perform the exercises to maintain the muscle properties and the flexibility of the uh, muscles as well as the movement of the joints and all that so that time it will work but as soon as the patient goes into the Uh, off is wearing off is there then he again gets bedridden but we have to maintain the muscle property so that whenever there is on phase he should be able to perform the task uh, as per his uh, ability right see you often hear about disease modifying treatment which needs to be started before the motor symptoms occur now for somebody like me who's a non neurologist see i think recognizing a lot of parkinsons many of us perhaps notice the motor symptoms earlier and possibly the non motor symptoms might be visible only to the trained eye so is there a particular advice you could give all of us to say which would be the warning signs or signals where somebody should suspect parkinsons so as far as non motor symptoms are there then the caregiver or the patient relative they do easily identify that oh this problem you are having so the uh, patient relative caregiver they should be more attentive because loss of smell loss of taste this can be just by the patient himself he can say that i am not having to have i am not able to smell those things because and uh, other uh, uh, family member are able to they will say that something smell is coming but uh, the patient will not be able to smell that so he will come to know that some problem is there and at that time he can consult uh, the uh, any of the experts uh, of the medical fraternity and at the, all the uh, investigation all that will reveal that non motor function are the early signs and symptoms and if you will see then writing some time there will be problem in writing cognitive level the cognitive level changes that that are the, those important things which we can look for and uh, a proper uh, you can say symptom can be seen by the uh, patient relatives or their near and dear ones only great is there a way to identify a subgroup of patients who may have more autonomic Uh, effects amongst the wide range of parkinson's patients that one sees mukul would you like to take that first yeah so uh, patients uh, um, the atypical ones have a, a worse uh, autonomic involvement especially the msa patients uh, but of course parkinson's like i showed in non motor symptoms Uh, many patients of parkinsonism have a lot of autonomic involvement 
and we can do an autonomic battery of tests like uh, postural hypotension, uh, SSR response, uh, sympathetic skin response, the RR interval variation. All these things can be done to see which patients have got uh, a, a more severe variety of autonomic dysfunction. Great. Uh, you know, uh, you hear about uh, this uh, newer thing called the uh, ultrasonic cranial therapy. I mean, what is the current state on that? So this is basically lesioning. Like I told you, you can make a lesion in either the GPI, which is the globus pallidus internus, or the subthalamic nucleus. And uh, up till now, we were doing lesioning by surgical methods. But now we've got a focused ultrasound. And basically, with the help of magnetic resonance imaging with MRI, you can target a certain nucleus in the brain. And with the focused ultrasound, you can first you uh, give a short uh, stimulation, I mean, a, a short, uh, a low, low intensity beam, which will make that area glow on the MRI. So you know that you're on your target. And then you give a high intensity beam. Uh, which is focused from various uh, angles onto that target, which destroys the target. So basically, it creates a lesion in, in the GPI, uh, causing uh, the same effect that a deep brain stimulation does. The difference is that deep brain stimulation can be done bilaterally, whereas at the moment, it's not advised to do a focused ultrasound lesioning on both the sides. Uh, number two, it is best for tremor dominant variety of Parkinsonism because they are the ones who respond better. And some studies have done and certain studies have also shown that uh, and in US they have started doing high, uh, high frequency focused ultrasound lesioning of the brain, uh, especially the GPI. And this okay. can be done in a single seating. One goes uh, one, in a single uh, sitting. One goes to the MRI, gets it done, and then comes out. It's a non-invasive procedure. Um, I think it's going to cost about five, six lakhs. So it's cheaper than deep brain stimulation. But you can't undo it, and you can't program it. Right. Coming to that, I mean, Mukul, you know, I must tell you, I mean, I'm a urologist. So several years ago, we all got very excited with high-intensity focused ultrasound in treating prostate cancers. I mean, it comes with its own pros and cons. Yes. Now, when you talked about the programming part of it, now, when you have somebody who's had a DBS, if somebody needs reprogramming and who lives at a remote venue at this point in time, what is the state of the science today with remote programming of the DBS? Yeah, now... <clears throat> Now we have programming which can be done through the net. So it can be done. Uh, uh, programming can be done over the net. The patient can be visible on a video uh, and as an online real-time video. And one can change the programming parameters sitting in your place. And the patient may be hundreds of miles away or thousands of miles away. As long as he's got a good internet connection, programming can be done now. Okay, now, uh, Dr. Ranjan, uh, can I just ask you, if there were three things that you would advise me or anybody else to do to slow down the progression of Parkinson's, apart from obviously modifying the drugs as required, Sir. what do you think I would focus on? Focus on Arabic activities, focus on flexibility, focus on maintaining the strength of the muscle. So that is extremely useful. Now, are there people who are on treatment who might be drug intolerant? And how do you deal with that? Yeah, um, there are people who don't tolerate the drugs at all. Now we know that uh, there are many varieties of Parkinson's disease. We first used to think there's only one variety, but now we know there's a tremor dominant variety. We know there's a postural and uh, postural instability and gait uh, uh, dominant variety. And then there are people who are very, very sensitive to levodopa. They, they have a lot of intolerable side effects with levodopa. So these are the patients where you have to 
go very slow with the medicine you have to start low and uh, escalate it very slowly uh, these are the patients who may respond better to other medication like dopamine agonists or uh, amantadine uh, and of course uh, the role of Uh, uh, as Dr. Ranjan has uh, spoken, uh, has got a very big role to play in these patients and these patients may also uh, benefit with deep brain stimulation. But uh, 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 fortunately, the, these kind of patients are not uh, uh, common. And uh, so we don't kind of, uh, uh, we have most patients who do, res do respond very well to levodopa and the other medication. And of Great. course, these patients have a worse outcome. Sure. Uh, Dr. Ranjan, uh, what is the role of the core stability exercises in Parkinson's? So core stability exercises helps you to maintain the posture of the body because posture is one of the factor which uh, deteriorates fast and that leads to a postural instability as it, the subject is stooped and there is slow gait and the common fall is there. So it may prevent your fall and as well as maintain the posture. Excellent. See, I think the next question would be partly addressed by both of you, I think, you know. The first one is the progression of the disease after deep brain stimulation, number one. Number two, the role of physical therapy with a focus on the same patient after the DBS. Maybe you could take it in sequence, Mukul. Yeah, so the progression of the disease still continues uh, even in spite of deep brain stimulation. And the, ben the beauty of deep brain stimulation is that you can change the parameters as the uh, years go by. You can uh, reprogram the patient so that he kind of goes on to uh, keep on the benefit. It can go on for 10 years, 15 years. Now we have rechargeable batteries, so we don't have to replace these batteries which would normally have to be replaced after five years so um, um, but there are some studies which suggest that because of deep brain stimulation there may be a slight retardation in the progress of the illness also not everybody agrees to these studies but there are studies which show that but it doesn't halt completely that's for sure great dr andrew as uh, dr mukul said that uh, uh, reprogramming and parameter setting is one of the important part in DBS and when it is done then accordingly the flexibility of the muscle is there and uh, we can assist the subject in getting uh, the strength and all that because uh, programming is very important sir if it is uh, accurate because sometimes what happens with uh, such programming patient is not able to perform the task or whatever uh, uh, exercises we are trying to demonstrate or trying to get from the patient but as the program is, is set patient is comfortable he is able to do the movements and as he said that the progression is still on it will be on but surely it will help in leading a good quality of life of the subject that's right i think it's very very interesting that through this evening when we have had a wide range of subjects related to parkinson that's been covered what Mukul was talking about, the rechargeable batteries available. It looks like most of us have our rechargeable batteries and haven't lost on energy yet. It normally, I think, is a testimony to the quality of the speakers. And both of you, I think, have been outstanding. I think both in terms of the subject matter and the brevity, the brevity and the clarity in the way you have come across with your answers. With a virtual meeting, I think it'll be important to finish with a virtual question on the virtual treadmill, the availability and the expenses. But before we go into that question, I want to also thank the very disciplined participants. The participants have been excellent. The questions have come through the chat and very, very fine and well thought of and good quality questions have come through. So I think to me, to me, this has been one of the outstanding participative programs. And on behalf of the Neuro Aid and Research Foundation, like with everything else, 
one of the biggest and the most important points in any service that you offer is the awareness. The awareness about the variety of neurological conditions, the awareness about the access to the treatment, the awareness about the availability of the treatment, the awareness about the affordability of treatment, and lastly, lastly, the knowledge that organizations like the NeuroAid and Research Foundation are focusing substantially on taking care to a different level with a state-of-the-art neurorehabilitation, particularly with a focus on those who need it the most but may not have an access or may not be able to afford that treatment. So I think before we close, I would request Dr. Ranjan to comment on the question on the virtual treadmill. Dr. Ranjan. Sir, I didn't get the question, sir. There was some... Sorry, I will repeat the question. Yeah. You know, the question on the availability and the cost of the virtual treadmill. Okay. Uh, in, in, in India, sir, uh, we are looking for the virtual things, then it is a bit costly in terms of uh, other countries, Western countries. And still, I think it is uh, uh, developing and India, uh, in India, uh, the lot of, uh, there is no, you, you can say that uh, still it is in a starting phase. And uh, in coming future, we can see that if a uh, lot of, uh, uh, practice is being done, a lot of equipments are being bought, then hopefully we will be having the lower cost and our Prime Minister uh, uh, is also uh, very much uh, keen in having Make in India program. So later on, if the facilities and this uh, technology develops in India, then definitely the cost will come down. Right now it is very costly and sometimes it costs around uh, 1 to 2 crore also. So hopefully in future, as uh, technology is developing, we will see that uh, this will be a very accessible thing for all of us. Excellent. So what I would like to say now to all of our uh, participants of this wonderful evening would be for all of us to be able to move properly, a lot of drive, we all need to be driven by good quality muscle tone, muscle exercise, where necessary by medication, spot on diagnosis, great help with multiple partnerships. But then we always come to a question of what drives organizations. Organizations like the NeuroAid and Research Foundation, which many of us have been extremely passionate about, both Dr. Mukul Varma and I have been fortunate to serve on this as trustees. But like I said, when there's a lot of functionality and functions happening, there is always a driving functionary. A driving functionary whose passion goes beyond any limits. So I just want you all to see the person who always remains and enjoys, enjoys staying in a shadow of things. But I would love you to see the chief functionary of the NeuroAid and Research Foundation. Uh, Raji, would you like to just uh, move towards, towards me? That's Raji Chandru. Raji has been the driving force. The entire organizational structure, she goes well beyond her working hours, her working commitments, and driven very strongly by the passion and the emotion. So you and I know that whatever can be achieved by various methods of treatment, various kinds of strengthening, will really take us very, very far. But the emotional connect and the passion, the drive, is what makes you and I sit here on a Friday evening and see where we can take the world to the next level. So while you and I go home for a wonderful weekend, think about how much difference you can make to somebody else's life. That you would you like to say something? Thank you, participants. This was the first of a series of webinars. 
and we promise to bring you much more interesting uh, webinars so you and i can partner thank you so much thank you madam thank you for inviting me thank you all so much thanks for the participation have a great evening and a great weekend all of you thank you thank you raji thank you subra great lovely thank you thank you dr mukul thank you sir thank you dr ranjan yeah thank you sir thank you very much having thank you here you. on you. the platform of nrf thank you sir thank you all the people who have made this possible yeah yeah especially yes swapnil ujwal thank you for your help thank you sir. it's been a wonderful working with you guys thank, thank you. you sir thank you sir Yeah. Not at all. It's good. I mean, good.